Hey, Matt, welcome to the WorkRib podcast. For those who don't know you, can you share a little bit about yourself and some of the work you've been doing over the last few years? Hey, Rob. Yes, absolutely. Um, let me start by saying thank you for, for having me back on two guest appearances in quick succession. I'm, I'm very honored. Um, for those of you listening to the to the podcast, um, you know, my name is Matthew Boyd. I work as the head of product marketing at Unily. Um, I've actually spent more than a decade now uh, working in the intranet and digital employee experience space. Um, you know, and that's a, a varied career starting out in, in marketing and really trying to understand the story around the intranet, you know, it's, it's kind of history where it's, it's ended up today and how it's perceived within, within a, a lot of organizations. Um, and then I, I did a, a period of consultancy where I actually got to be quite hands-on and practical, um, in, um, you know, business consultancy, essentially understanding business problems and how the internet could solve them and then delivering internet solutions to, to customers. And now I find myself uh, bringing that experience to bear in the world of product marketing and, and talking about the Unity platform and, and how it's changing, uh, you know, the digital employee experience for 5 million users around the world. Fantastic. And one of the questions I wanted to kind of dig into with you was that uh, Unily uh, has absolutely crushed it in terms of one of the latest reports coming out from leading analysts. Can you elaborate on what truly differentiates Unily from the other digital workplace platforms that are out there on the market? And in fact, what are some of the things that we don't necessarily see in those reports that you know, folks, if they're comparing and contrasting, they should keep in mind? That's a really really good question um and i think importantly my answer will will inevitably come with some level of bias because um, having worked at unily for you know more than uh, 10 years um i've seen the product grow and the company grow alongside it and um i genuinely believe we're doing amazing work so, but what i'll try and do is take a step out of the product marketing role and, and take a more objective stance. Um, it's, it's amazing to be recognized by these independent analyst organizations. Um, it's incredibly hard work. Um, those reports, uh, they don't write themselves. And there's a lot of detail that goes in from, from not just Unly, but, but every kind of uh, intranet provider and and those even aspiring to become an intranet provider from tangential markets. Um, so I think the important thing to understand about, about how Unily has scored well in those reports is that it's a combination of product strength and customer testimonial. Um, and I think that is, is kind of one of the most critical elements. It is a testament to our product engineering teams who have built an incredible platform. Um, and, you know, it's not just about the breadth of functionality, but in our case, very often about the depth of functionality. Um, so when we talk about looking at Unily through a differentiated lens, um, I think the types of organizations that, that we look to work with are often the largest most complex, although they don't like to admit that they're a complex business, they are often facing complex challenges and, and they, they are, you know, um, as a result of that, some of the more demanding organizations, and I mean that in a good way, they, they set a high standard, a high bar for, for their digital employee experience. And I think that given those are the kind of businesses that, that Unily looks to work with, what we have done to differentiate ourselves is focus heavily on enterprise scalability. So it is about how do you store and manage millions of content items when you're serving, uh, you know, knowledge, information, communications to hundreds of thousands of people with varied jobs in over 140 countries. Um, that requires something special in the way of 
information architecture, content governance, um, and Unly has really honed in on those aspects of its platform to support that kind of um, uh, that level of complexity and that need. But we've simultaneously focused on enterprise grade configuration as well. Yeah. So what we found is with smaller organizations, um, you know, that are looking for really fast time to value, they're often willing to make trade-offs between uh, functionality that is out of the box and just ready to go and what they can tweak and amend to be very unique to their organization. And there is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a balance there. Um, as you know, what our experience has been that as we start to, to move up that scale, um, businesses demand greater levels of control, greater levels of, of configuration, um, that's put into their hands and their administrative team's hands, um, in order to optimize the platform for, for very specific or bespoke requirements and needs. Um, so I think those two elements combined mean that we've built out a lot of of intranet capability or a digital employee experience capability but we've done so in a way that focuses on um uh, high degrees of control and exceptional levels of scalability um so you know that is kind of one element of differentiation within within the analyst reports and i think it's it's kind of that across our entire product which help us to get really strong product scores we go broad that ability to really walk the line between simplicity but com complexity particularly for those enterprise class customers who are mm -hmm. looking to make sure that their digital workplace actually looks and feels like their home they're part of an extension of their organization is that is that accurate that's absolutely you've hit the nail on the head you know um it took me three minutes to say what you could say in, in 30 seconds, Rob, you're a... <laughs> I, I also might have spent a little bit of time in this industry as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just a, a couple of days or weeks. <laughs> just a smidge. <laughs> just a smidge, exactly. Um, but it's true, though, in the fact that, you know, you, you like you were saying, even in your introduction, right, you've spent years in professional services, which um, I feel that uh, in a bias here, I feel that as well as pre-sales are really the trenches of this business, because you get to see on the back end, really the the guts and gore of an implementation and program strategy and having to, you know, instill governance in your customers who, you know, might not want to have that difficult conversation, but it's only keys to make them successful. And then on the front end of that, it's really trying to make sure you define rationale to them that, hey, we can't have everything we want, but we can make this as perfect as it can be. Yeah. So it's it's that experience. It's it, that's really coming across in, in what you're telling us today. Um, one of the things I wanted to know is that um, through some of the trends and challenges that you see, mm. particularly from what the analysts are saying, right? Um, how has Unily begun to address some of those needs as a part of their product roadmap between what the market is asking for and then on the front side, what you're developing in terms of a product point of view? Yeah, it's another really, you know, they're great questions because I think you can answer them so many different ways. Um, and I think the first thing that I think is really important is, is I think of what I'm learning is actually um, democratization of product mm. roadmaps is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, you can't just flick the switch and say, cool, we'll just, you know, everyone could just vote and we'll just build what everyone says. There's a lot more maturity that goes into it. And, it, you know, it'd be fair to say that Unily has been on, on a growth trajectory, a, you know, maturity, um, you know, uh, trajectory as well as it relates to how we define and build out our product into the future. And I think selfishly, uh, you know, and, and kind of quite boastfully, I think we're probably leading the way within our market in a customer partnered roadmap execution. Oh, um, interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it it is interesting because I think in my early days, I was kind of like, oh, I have all these great ideas. We should build what I want. <laughs> and um, what you actually start to realize is that there is so much power in, um, in the customer collaboration, mm. so much untapped insight. So, I mean, the key trends and challenges. So you asked me, what are the key trends and challenges that we're addressing? Mm. Well, actually, the great thing is that we don't actually have to work out what those are in isolation. We're speaking to our customers. We're hearing from them what their challenges are and, and what they see as the next big trend they need to solve for within the digital employee experience. And it allows us to create a roadmap which is able to move past the shiny object syndrome and that, I think, is where um, some vendors sometimes get get caught. They want yeah. to be, you know, they want to be perceived as innovative. And and you'll know you've seen like these kind of uh, analyst reports, and they measure you on like things like innovation and roadmap quality and things like that, right? And it's um it's grueling because you want to be able to show them that you're building amazing, cool new things, but it has to add value to your customers. Um, and so I'll give you one great example and who cannot talk about AI when we talk about roadmap execution. Right. <laughs> um, it, a great example is given the kind of customers we work with that they're, they're very large, um, and they often have quite grandiose aspirations now when it comes to AI digital assistants and, and, and the future of digital agents, AI powered digital agents in the workplace. So when this kind of technology first started to emerge, you know, in a kind of a real way beyond the kind of base level AI chatbots, Q&A pairing behind the scenes, you know, with some base level NLP kind of wrapped around it. Um, now we're at a point where real digital assistants are emerging. Now, while some, uh, you know, while different vendors, not just in the internet market, but in many markets, we're like, cool, okay, so what we should do is we should have our own digital assistant. The internet should have a digital assistant. And that might work for certain organizations. But through conversations with our customers, we actually started to realize that many of them had big internal AI programs that they wanted yep. to accelerate. But they also wanted to look at market leading digital assistants, AI digital assistants. Um, which meant that there is a big question mark there about how good your digital assistant is going to be versus the likes of WorkGrid, for example, who have spent years building up an incredible you know, market-leading solution. Can you build something better than a specialist in a specific field? Um, and it, it kind of helps you to try to understand that you know, a lot of these large enterprises, their strategy is to try and bring together best of breed applications mm. across various markets and deliver a cohesive digital employee experience versus trying to have one vendor trying to be uh, all things to all people. And I think that's a really like interesting story because it speaks to the emergence of AI capabilities, how different organizations think about, you know, what they want from their internet provider, and then how you can create a roadmap that, um, that prioritizes, you know, your your kind of engineering capacity against the the true value for customers. That's great. It, it sounds like you're you're really honed in on having the the customer advocacy as a part of the conversations in your roadmap, and mm. the product having the ability to create composable experiences based upon their tech stack, based upon what they have exactly. in house. Again, Rob, you summar you can play back everything I say so much better than me. <laughs> we should just timestamp. <laughs> I should have had a career in, in marriage counseling or therapy or something. Yeah, exactly. I think the the write-up on the podcast needs the timestamps of 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 Rob's summaries <laughs> of, of Matt Boyd's waffle, and then it's just perfectly like layered in if you are short on time. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, so what are some of those new product features that enhance really the EX and engagement and productivity mm -hmm. that we hear about that, you know, truly differentiate Unily in terms of what they're offering to their customers? What's what's the new things under the sun? 
Well, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, there's we're doing a lot. Um, you know, uh, do you know what? I'll I'll be selfish. I'm going to cherry pick the things that I'm most excited about. Do it. Yeah. Um, so, like first one, um, uh, doing big work around analytics. Um, you know, I think that it's a huge problem. It's mm. been trying to help business leaders understand what digital employer experience is and how they're doing at it is is really challenging. I don't think, um, I think it'd be fair to say that nobody really has a definitive answer to that right now. But through significant investment in our analytics offering, Unilever is looking to close that gap to help uh, business leaders um, get to the insight really beyond the numbers. I mean, we've been mm. got data, you know, huge volumes of data um, captured in these systems, but distilling that down to insights, that's really, really kind of where, uh, you know, the rubber meets the road. And we're not only have we kind of um, you know broken out our analytics service into a microservice, so from a technical perspective, what that means is we can evolve our reporting capabilities independently of the core platform, which means oh, rapid, you know, rapid innovations. When we need to adapt our analytics reporting methodology, we mm -hmm. can move quickly to do so because of the microservice architecture. And that's kind of techy, but it's also really cool because it does mean for a customer fast innovation in the space of analytics and reporting. And that that is a space that's moving fast, but we're also weaving AI into our analytics service. And this is kind of about beyond the shiny object syndrome again, kind of like, you know, there are some really cool kind of um, AI features that are circulating in the consumer world, like AI image generation and things like yes. that. But, um, you know, there is a big difference between that and service level AI, which can like wrap, say, machine learning models um, or or underlying AI services into your data set to kind of generate, summarize insights for business mm. leaders. And that's a big area of focus for us at the moment. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, and the other bit is, um, you know, around frontline worker um, and... I mean, that label in of itself is a hugely complex term and frontline worker can mean so many different things. There are so many different types of frontline worker, but ultimately, it, you know, it's things like one-to-one -one chats, um, which will actually be released imminently. Um, oh, very cool. Yeah, it, it is cool. Um, I actually really like it, um, you know, and it's, it, it's the interesting thing about it is like, as a, as a knowledge worker, we take things like Microsoft Teams almost for granted now, like I can, you know, just sure. manage anybody and coordinate. Um, but for frontline workers, um, you start to get into this kind of gray area of kind of shadow IT and WhatsApp and fa private Facebook groups, um, trying to kind of muddle your way through a need for for secure one-to-one -one or group communications in, in the organization. And so this is really gonna mark a, a step change for us in how we serve frontline workers um, you know, through that mobile app experience. So that's that's pretty cool too. And those are two areas that are absolutely critical, particularly at the enterprise level, right? I analytics, uh, they had stagnated for years and you'd constantly hear customers talk that they they wanted more insights into the data. It can't just simply be Dao Mao or hey, we have 80% of our employees come to the homepage. That's great because you defaulted everyone's browser to the homepage. Yes. <laughs> the yeah. reason for this. <laughs> yeah. But how are they using it? How do they feel about it? Are they actually getting business value out of it? Those are the, the details and the story that plays out in the data that if you can extract that, well, that's valuable to your digital workplace leader, your community manager. I'm not sure if that's an age term. That's what was used ages ago. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's who's looking for those bits that help them really justify the value of their platform, of their program strategy. And on the the deskless worker side, um, the one to one chat, you know, it's funny that that's a feature set that gets 
that, that doesn't get looked at too often. And it should, because guess what? The person who's out there installing cable or out there in retail, they're texting, they're using WhatsApp, they're calling up their buddy, Jim, Jane, whatever, and they're looking for information and knowledge. So why not wrap that inside your digital workplace so that those conversations live as part of the data fabric of your organization? So that's fantastic that you're looking at those two areas. Yeah, hundred percent. Really exciting, and um, you know, as always, the customer is at the heart of it. Um, mm -hmm. Our analytics service, you know, we run um, we run really cool kind of like maze user experience testing. So shout out to the the maze platform. There you go. So <laughs> little endorsement, but we use kind of um, UX testing programs that customers can kind of like you know if we're kind of redesigning something like filters on an analytics dashboard. Um, you know, all customers can participate, try out the new the new potential design or input, feedback on that. That goes straight to the product management team. So it's a direct channel, no intermediaries, no kind of like, you know, direct channel with feedback to the product managers themselves. Um, and then with larger features like one-to-one -one chat, active preview programs, right? You have features built, ready to go, but it's not really finished mm. until it's been tested you know, on the front lines, literally in the sense of one-to-one -one chat. So, um, you know, we put the the one-to-one -one chat capabilities out in some of those largest enterprises that are struggling with with that kind of style of communication. So it's a great, great customer collaboration story too. Excellent. One of the things I want to discuss with you is a hot topic that's coming around. Um, I guess not just within internets, but really digital workplace leaders, end user computing and the rise of your C AIO, um, which is AI governance. We hear mm. that as being a hot topic. Tell me, what's Unilever's position on the ability uh, to integrate AI and compose it to right-sized with an organization's decree mm. on how AI should work for them? Yeah, do you know, it's, um, it's fundamental. You know, when we talk about Unilever's position on the topic of of AI and and you know, especially you know the governance um, of AI, mm. um, you know, it's language we use within our own business governed AI, um, and I think that when we look at AI within the world of work, it has this like overwhelming promise to transform productivity and digital employee experience and um you know uh, it's gonna tap into all this latent potential within our organization and accelerate success and break down silos it has this this huge promise to transform ultimately the world yes. of work um and i want to see i think that for a lot of cios that scares the out of them yeah. <laughs> insert a, a bleep in your editing there rob <laughs> no worries um it does because you know business leaders who are operating outside of the cio org are saying well i want you know basically chat gpt to to produce marketing collateral for me and i want to be able to um use ai to analyze our sales performance and there is so much secure data um, and, uh, you know, e even kind of intellectual property, right? Like even forget the data, right? Then the, And no one should forget the data. But for a second, put that to one side and just think about the intellectual property. Somebody has a great idea and they feed that into, um, into these, these uh, you know, maybe publicly available and self-learning models. Mm. And, and, and what kind of, how does that erode a business advantage, for example. And I think that th these kind of questions um, are the ones that that keep CIOs up at night because they're being asked to, to work out an AI strategy, which can bring AI into the business, but in a managed and secure way, a way where it can be governed. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the opportunity for, for vendors like Unily and Vendors in various other markets, how do you harness emerging AI services in a way that puts containers and controls around yes. it? Provide like central places to access the AI services, which are not, um, you know, an individual going off and using unsanctioned 
um, services out in the wild, you have to be able to provide it to them uh, in in government controlled environments. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, the other part of that strategy, which is key, is about being selective on the AI services and providers that you work with. A lot of the AI services Unilever has worked with to date, and you know, uh, to be clear, AI in the space of intranets is actually not new. It's getting bigger and bigger, but Unilever's AI strategy began at the inception of, of the, the platform itself, because when it first launched, we were already using early iterations of Microsoft's AI translation service. Mm -hmm. So the story of the AI intranet is, is long running for, for Unilever at least, um, but it's always about, you know, and, and that's that first um, kind of AI feature. It was a Microsoft service. And a lot of our additional AI features are Microsoft services. We, we look to... Um, heavily interrogate the security, the quality of the offering, and the level of governance and control that can be passed through to our customers when we're looking at what AI services to introduce and not to introduce. Um, so in that respect, we pick services which allow us to provide governance and controls to our customers as downstream beneficiaries of, of that integration. Um, and that that's kind of, you know, uh, our stance on it ultimately is that, you know, putting, you know, you can't stop the adoption of AI, but you can de-risk it. And that is is kind of where we're trying to help. I think that's a key bit, right? Is I, I remember, I, I don't know who the speaker was, but I was at an event and they had some nice statistics around the use of shadow AI already. Uh, apparently some of the organizations they had worked with had started to perform some sense making on um, uh, folks passing data out and then suddenly getting data back in from personal email addresses. And so what they were doing was, let's say it's marketing, content creation or whatnot, they were uh, kicking information over and then a few minutes later, things are coming back in from their personal email addresses that is certainly, it looked, smelled like chat GPT um, content generation. And yeah. that's, Look, that's going to happen. People are going to find, they're like mice, they're going to find the quickest route to the cheese. And if it can help them do their job a little bit better, 10% better, they're going to do that. So why not compose your digital workplace to provide those same tools as appropriate for the organization? So at least you're keeping, as you said, a container around it, a governance wrapper around it with rights to use and terms and conditions that at least it's staying in house and yep. that i think is is certainly a missed opportunity and are you seeing that with your your customers are they starting to take up and tick up on this the realization of starting to use the digital workplace in this fashion yeah we are we are definitely but i mean full transparency there's a big split yeah you know, we see some organizations who are dying to to kind of use new AI services and they love the fact that through Unly they can use some, like for example, let's take the chat GPT and the content generation piece, right? So they can securely use that from within their, their Unly intranet to generate mm -hmm. content, right? So that gives a, a secure and governed environment through which they can access the uh, GPT services. And some clients are super excited about that potential and then there are other customers who on the far side of that are honestly they are very smart and they say we're not ready for this mm. our business is not ready to yep. to utilize these kind of capabilities right now we don't have the digital dexterity beyond traditional internet experiences at this stage to um, utilize it effectively and securely. And we are not positioned right now to train our global enterprise and upskill them to a level where we can start to roll out, you know, these kind of emerging AI capabilities. And in true Unily fashion, all our AI capabilities can be turned off um, and, and even turned on for select individuals. So we're able to then match their needs uh, within their business in, in that respect. Um, but it isn't, uh, you know, uh, 
maybe surprising, maybe unsurprising. I'm unsure. I think I was maybe a little bit surprised when I realized this to be a reality, but not everyone is saying, yes, give me all things AI, even if it's secure and governed. Yeah, people are people um, at the end of the day, <laughs> right? You're going to have what, some organizations rushing and it all depends on their culture and then some holding the horses back. Um, and then in the middle is the, well, what are workers doing that should be ultimately be attuned to your business and your direction? I think the fact that Unilever is offering that ability to go in with a composable phased approach, let's say, where we're going to start small, certain pockets of the organization, let's say if you're that type of organization, and we're going to show success early using X, Y, and Z in terms of AI, and then mm -hmm. prove that out as a part of our business story. I think that's a fantastic for those organizations who are going to be those laggards, who might want to try a little bit of the safe space of utilizing yeah. AI. And as they formalize their uh, back-end strategy on really using much more deeper machine learning for mm. their operations or whatnot. Well, you can separate that out from the employee experience. It doesn't have to be, you know, one whole program, but at least from a management perspective, there's ways that you can begin to introduce that. That's, yeah. that's promising, particularly yeah. for those large mm. risk adverse organizations that you oftentimes will come across. Well, so then let me pose a question to you, Rob. Um, mm. So, I mean, the, the question I suppose that I ask myself is who's going to come out on top? Do you think it's, um, you know, on the one hand, you've got um, the kind of uh, digital native and digital accelerators. They adopt AI really rapidly, but they maybe don't have the governance and controls in place when they, they kind of start unleashing that potential. And they then have to retrospectively down the line strip, pull back, reset expectation and introduce governance? Or do you think that the digital laggards who take their time um, and, and, and plan and build skills and expertise before rolling out eventually overtake those those kind of, those people who've, who've rushed in? Where, where do you, which side do you think is gonna come yeah. out on top? That's a great question. Um, and I, I don't wanna give you the the ex consultants answer <laughs> where I just get <laughs> run it right down the middle. Um, <laughs> I don't think the laggards ever win, right? I, I think it's okay. those who are at least going to innovate, but innovate as attuned to your organization and what mm -hmm. you do. So I think the organizations that take a front of rack, really wrapping a program and understanding, hey, look, we can deliver to our knowledge workers the right fit of the gen AI capabilities that mm -hmm. allow them to work better safely in a productive manner. I think those organizations that adopt that fashion and then look at the, okay, how are we going to use AI and ML to optimize our operations, to create better risk profiles for our customers? Let's say if we're an insurance company or formulate new products based upon our customer data. like. That I see as the organizations who will make it to top, where they're actually, they're putting in a chief AI officer, they're putting a program strategy in place. Like you, I in conversations, what I oftentimes see is that, hey, we're doing a little AI over here and a little AI over here, and, but it's nothing that's cohesive in terms of an overarching strategy, which a large scale, this is large scale, business transformation happening with generative technology that's akin to the printing press. Now that took hundreds of years for adoption yeah. To, yeah. to take hold, right? You're looking at something that's what? Um, well, at least with Gen AI being top of mind for customers, that's 18, 19 months at this point. And you could just look at the stock tickers of NVIDIA and AMD and Apple, which yep. you know are just skyrocketing. It is a bubble market. There is a lot of hype behind it. Um, but behind all hype, there is a large golden nugget there to be maintained. The organizations that understand that and define it to their people and what they do as a business, I think will absolutely come out on top. Having a tool like Unily that is composable, that you can execute with your strategy I think is where you start to make that win mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, going with products that are AI washed where, Hey, we, 
we got AI yes. everything. We're throwing in our 10K. It's in our press releases. And that's, yeah. you got to strip it away and understand, okay, that's fluff. <laughs> Everyone has that now. A hundred percent. You know, and it comes back to my point about, you know, roadmap execution at the start. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, um, rushing to build a digital assistant and then you don't have the uh, tens and twenties of, of engineers that are required to actually accelerate that in line with market expectation. I mean, that, that space, digital assistant and digital agent space accelerating. Oh, yes. So fast. I mean, uh, you know, I actually, I went to Gartner conference recently and I went to the, the Microsoft booth digital workplace summit. And, um, there was nothing on the booth except the words Microsoft Copilot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is the whole story now. Yes. Um, and you can just imagine the levels of investment that go into go into that. I mean, still got a long way to go with that one from my trial experience, I'll be honest with you. But um, you know, in the point being more more broadly, we don't though, necessarily is position ourselves as we don't position ourselves as a copilot because um this is just, you know complete transparency yeah. um denotation of that moniker will mm -hmm. succeed or fail based upon how microsoft executes at the end of the day because they have put so much marketing behind that we've seen yeah. a number of our competitors move into we're a co-pilot too yeah. okay <laughs> if microsoft executes poorly that will be considered the chat bot the way the chat bot is deemed today which was yeah. a very poor experience. Yep. Um, and then you see that. You see that happening. And mm -hmm. so I think there's there's a bit of that of understanding, well, underneath the covers, it's like any other product. Underneath mm -hmm. the covers, what does it do? What does the roadmap look like? What is their years of success? Do they have those years of success behind them? Do they have the logos behind them that showcase that, yes, they can execute for your business? And you know, this is a, a segue here, but, you know, can you share with us a quick customer story? Um, I mean, you had hundreds of customers mm. that, um, you know, has really propelled their business forward, their employee experience forward with the use of Unilink. Yeah. Um, God, I mean, honestly, there's, um, you know, obviously I looked at the questions beforehand. So there's lots of examples to, to draw upon. Um, Do you know, I with all the talk about AI, I'm actually I'm not going to pick a customer story about implementation of of AI features and services. And I think what in my head that means is that there are fundamentals in digital employee experience that mm. most organisations still uh, struggle to get right. And actually, you know, we're at risk of thinking that AI could solve that problem overnight in in a flick of a switch. And so for me, um, I think one of the most compelling stories that I've kind of looked at recently was, um, you know, the story of, of Kersner, um, you know, hospitality, mm. you know, luxury hotels. Um, I'm sure if you, if anybody listens to this podcast, Googles them, you'll recognize a few of the names in that, in that pretty impressive list. But importantly, their story was one of, connecting the dots between the customer experience and the employee experience. They said, okay, so um, we've got frontline workers who speak to our guests, our, our high paying guests every day. How do they feel about working for Kersner? Are no, they happy? Yes, yeah, so like, are, they, are they happy? Are they, are they engaged? Do they want to do, give 110% every day? And the gut feel was, Yes, but then the follow-on question becomes, well, have we given them everything that they need to achieve that 110%? Like that that best will in the world, I want to help this customer, this this uh, guest at the hotel um, have the best possible experience. But I don't have the answers or the information I need to answer their question. And then they have to wait while I go and find somebody else who knows the answer. And it, it's scenarios like that that they recognize as being detractors from the customer experience. And so they set about you know, a path and a mission to empower their frontline workers with the right tools and the right information that translated their high levels of engagement, their their love for the Kersner brand and for their work 
into um, the ability to deliver for in terms of customer experience. They created um, a frontline mobile app using Udemy, of course, um, and they put in there things like frontline worker FAQ catalogs for customer questions. What questions do customers ask frequently and how can we accelerate the time to information um, by, by making that all available in one central location? And that's just one small part of, you know, their, their kind of overall uh, employee experience platform. But it spoke to me this, this kind of bigger story about, um, you know, even the most engaged employees that we have right now, if we haven't given them the right tools to do their job, um, they can really struggle. And um, so I, I love that Curzon story. And I, I love that it, it connects how we treat our people with the downstream impact on how our customers feel about our brand and about their service and experience. So that's my story. I think it's a really good one. And actually there's a, dare I say it, it's more promotion from Unly, but whether you're looking for an intranet or not, we've got a great video case study. And I think it's a really interesting story that people could watch after this, after this podcast, if they, you know, have another five minutes to spare. Fantastic. Actually, that's probably a good note to end on. So Matt, where can folks learn a bit more? So um, simply, you can go to unily.com. Um, if you go to unily.com, there is loads of great, completely free insights. Um, you know, as I say, if you go to in the navigation, our clients page, there's loads of video stories in there. If you're interested in understanding real stories from, from large enterprises who are tackling the digital employee experience challenge, um, go to the client's page, check that out. If you're interested in some kind of more, uh, you know, inspirational insights, then have a little look at the Insight Center. You'll find guides, white papers, kind of our new digital noise survey, for example, full of statistics about how the way we execute digital applications in the workplace can be hugely disruptive. So let's say you are thinking about a new intranet and you don't want to create more digital noise. You should read that report full of data points and research, which is completely free again. Excellent. Fantastic. Matt, thanks for coming on to the show today. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's always a pleasure.